One of the predominant laboratory instruments used for radio frequency and microwave design purposes is the vector network analyzer. A VNA is ideally suited for measuring the response of a DUT, device under test, as a function of frequency. The primary output of a VNA is reflected in transmitted power ratios or the square roots thereof. Through mathematical manipulation of the power ratios, a large amount of valuable data can be extracted. A few examples that can be measured with the VNA are the skin effect losses, dielectric constant variations, characteristic impedance, capacitive and inductance variations, and coupling coefficients. Furthermore, since VNAs are typically designed with the microwave engineer in mind, they can make reliable measurements to extremely high frequencies. The primary disadvantage is that they provide data in the frequency domain. Subsequently, it's necessary to translate the extracted data into a useful format that can be used in the time domain. In the past, most digital designs had no need for extracted electrical characteristics in the hundreds of megahertz range, simply because their operating frequencies were low compared to today's systems. Modern bus designs, however, are becoming so fast that such measurements are a necessity. As bus speeds past the 500 megahertz region, rise and fall times are required to be as fast as 100 picoseconds. Subsequently, the frequency content of the digital waveform can easily exceed 3 gigahertz. As bus frequencies increase, the resolution required to measure capacitance, inductance, and resistance increases. To the design engineer, proper characterization to a fraction of a picofarad, for example, might be necessary to characterize the timings on a bus accurately. If used properly, the VNA is the most accurate tool available to extract the electrical parameters necessary to simulate high-speed designs. Hello again and welcome. Sorry if my voice sounds a little hoarse, I've been trying to get over a cold. So today we're going to be looking at a device that a friend of mine had sent me. This is a small pocket vector network analyzer. And I had seen these up on RF Cafe while well, he went ahead and bought a couple of these and shipped me one to have a look at. So I really have very little idea about what we can and can't do with this thing. I have not opened it yet. It's a nice little plastic case. So it comes with a couple of patch cable it looks like. This would be their calibration. Look at the size of this thing. A little battery pack down there. Some shielding. Looks like the USB connector there. This is probably your on off switch. Well, looks like it fires right up. So I have a vector network analyzer. It's made by HP. It's an 8754. It was made in the 1970s. It's got an upper bandwidth of 1.3 gigahertz. Uh, the system I have, the S parameter set, is good for 2.6 gigahertz, and I have the doubler for the instrument. The one thing I have for it also is the storage normalizer, and basically that allows me to pull the data off of that into lab view. And the main thing that I can do with that then is I can run a calibration so I have my own standards and I can save those off to a file. Uh, this thing I noticed when I was looking at the description of it, it supports uh, touchstone files and I can do that as well with my LabVIEW software for the old HP. I think that this network analyzer is good for 900 megahertz. What I'm going to be doing first I think is just read the manual on this and try to learn how to use it and then maybe we can work through some demonstrations with it. Alright, so the first thing I'd like to do is get this film off of here. Looks like to do that, we'll have to remove this faceplate. It's good the screws are not very tight. There we go. And let's just go ahead and peel that right off of there. So one of the first things that you need to do before using the unit is you're going to have to calibrate it. The unit's actually supplied with some calibration standards. One of these will be a short, there will be an open, and a load, and a through. This one is going to be the load, which in this case it's going to be a 50 ohm system. So if we install this, see we read 50 ohms. So that's our load. This is our through. One of these will be an open, and that happens to be this one, and this will be our short. 
and you can see it's reading basically zero ohms. Typically this is referred to as a salt calibration, so short, open, load, and through. If you're just going to use one port of the network analyzer, say you just want to look at impedance for example, then you're only going to need the short, open, and load standards. The only time that you're going to need that through is if you're looking at the transmission. Let's talk a little bit about what a network analyzer is. Essentially there's two different types. There's a vector network analyzer and then the other type is a scaler. Essentially the difference is that one can measure phase, the other one can't. So what exactly is a network analyzer? A few of you may remember a video that I did recently where I was using some fiber optic cable and I was trying to measure the speed of light. And in that experiment I had a lens and I was shooting some light through that lens. Some of it's going through, we call that the incident. And then we have some of it reflecting back. That's called the reflected power. And then essentially out here I have a load. In this case it's a mirror. And again that mirror is going to absorb some of the energy. But some of it is going to get reflected back. And then I can have another receiver out here that measures how much of that is actually being reflected back. So this is similar to a network analyzer. Except the light over here is typically going to be at one frequency. With a network analyzer, I'm typically going to have a sweep generator. So it's a pretty common piece of test equipment. It's called a tracking generator. You normally use that in conjunction with a spectrum analyzer. And essentially what it does is the frequency that the spectrum analyzer is sweeping is going to output a voltage that controls that tracking generator, which will output another frequency that's synchronized with that spectrum analyzer. So essentially, as that spectrum analyzer is doing the sweep, that generator is tracking it. So you can imagine, basically, I've got this spectrum analyzer here. And I've got this tracking generator over here. This has got a receiver. And then this is again controlling this tracking generator. This is sending out a signal. And in between these two I have some kind of device that I'm wanting to test my dot. So as this guy sweeps through the frequency, this is going to display the magnitude or the amplitude of this signal. So if I had, for example, a high-pass filter, I'd get a waveform something like this out of my spectrum analyzer. It's very similar to what a scalar network analyzer is, in that, again, there's no phase information. A vector network analyzer is also going to have some kind of a oscillator circuit, and that essentially is going to drive into a splitter. Part of this signal is going to run into what we call a directional coupler. There's two different types. There can be a bi-directional coupler, and that could look something like this, where essentially it can measure the forward power as well as the reflected, or we could have a unidirectional where it just measures in one direction. So we pass this oscillator out through this directional coupler. This goes to one port of the network analyzer, and then on the receive side, this is going to feed to a detector. So with this information, we can measure how much power is actually being delivered to our load, how much is being reflected back, and in the case of a two-port system, I again have some kind of a dud out here, I can measure how much power is delivered through the load into my other detector. The device that's typically connected out here is going to be something that's reactive. It could be a capacitor, some inductor, but essentially it's going to have a phase component to it. So what we need to do is not only look at our incident signal that we're applying, we also want to look at the phase relationship of the return signal. And then having both the phase and the magnitude information, we can actually back calculate what the impedance of this circuitry is. And of course, depending on what we're trying to actually measure, say for example, I just want to know the impedance, I don't actually have to attach the device across the two channels. I can actually just place it on the output here. So very similar to what I was doing with that TDR measurement where I was trying to measure the speed of light, I was sending a pulse down a piece of coax. And then I was terminating the opposite end of the coax with either a load or I had an open or a short. And you may remember that with the load, basically nothing was returned. And then depending on if I had an open or a short, would depend on if the waveform would be returned in phase or out of phase. But essentially all the energy that was being transmitted down the coax was being reflected back. So it's the same thing with the network analyzer. If I 
installed a 50 ohm load out here and this is a 50 ohm system basically no power is reflected back but to be able to calculate other types of loads out here we need two other data points and essentially that's done with a SOLT S-O-L-T that stands for short open load and through so we're going to apply short directly to the output of this and open a load which in this case would be 50 ohms and then if we want to measure transmission or the power going through the device we'll need the through and essentially that just shorts the input to the output and then with all that information stored in a calibration that's going to allow us to calculate the complex impedance or the amount of gain or attenuation that this device has this is looking at the manual for my S parameter set for the old HP vector network analyzer here you can see the different S parameters so S11 for example this is the RF signal generator. These are the two ports of the network analyzer. You can see these are the two directional couplers. And you'll notice that there's a couple of relays in here that will route the signal to the different receiver inputs. Over here is our splitter. There's our reference port. And there's also a couple of bias T's. And then depending on what type of S parameter you're measuring, it'll change these relays. This relay on the right is what we call the transfer relay. So actually if I took that big box apart you would actually find it's basically empty. There's only a couple of components inside of that whole box. You'll notice the connector types are quite a bit different. These are an APC7 connector. Let me just show you what one looks like. One of the big mistakes you could make is to put your finger across this thing. You don't want to ever do that. Likewise, you've got to be very careful when you're cleaning these. Because any kind of disruption to a connector like this, uh, you're going to hurt its performance. Same thing with the SMAs. Basically, you don't want to be handling the thread part of this connector. If you do, I would just take some solvent. Spray a little bit on the end of a Q-tip. And then just wipe off your fingerprints. Best thing to do is just not touch them at all. If you can avoid it. Likewise, when you go to install your connectors, you don't want to rotate the connector like this. So you don't want the pin on the inside rotating inside of the barrel of the connector. You want it to pull straight in, so just rotate this with your finger. Next thing that you need to do is torque it. These wrenches will come preset, and essentially you rotate it until it clicks. And you can see it's now quite tight. And there are standards on what the torque setting should be for all these connectors. You need to do that if you're going to try to get the optimum performance. This analyzer is only good for 900 megahertz. That's going to actually be quite forgiving as far as the CAL standards uh, and the types of cables that you're going to use. So I was thinking about what I had said as far as torquing these connectors. This is a standard 8 millimeter wrench. I had seen somebody actually use a fish scale on the end of a wrench like this. So if you know the length of the wrench, you can calculate how much torque is applied by knowing the upward force. Uh, that would certainly be one way to do it if you didn't want to spend the money on a good torque wrench. What you shouldn't do is try to tighten this thing by hand because there's a real good chance you're going to screw up the connector. So that reminded me of a time where I had loaned out a torque wrench to a co-worker. I didn't know that they had never used a torque wrench before in their life. What had apparently happened is they damaged the connectors on the test equipment that they were using the torque wrench with. I later asked him what had happened and as it turned out, they actually had it off to the side like this. So they were rotating it like this and they said basically the wrench never clicked. So don't make that mistake. If you're going to use a torque wrench, hold the wrench perpendicular to the connector like this and then again just rotate it until it clicks. So for home use, I can't really afford a good set of calibration standards, so I chose to make my own. And you can see I have several SMA connectors on here. This is our through. This is our open. You can see with the stub, this side is the short. And these two resistors here make up the load. This unused section here can be used to mount components that you want to measure. Typically that's one of the reasons that you're going to make a board like this is if you're wanting to characterize components basically what you want to do is remove the effects of the circuit board, the connectors, the cabling and we want to basically nullify all that or de-embed it and get right to where our part is. 
So basically we're trying to remove as many errors as possible from our measurement. So you can see I have several of these circuit boards. So when I need one of these, I'll just cut off a section or I'll just build up on one of these. So these are all controlled impedance. This is set for 50 ohms. These are the cables that were supplied with the unit. I'm really not sure the quality of these cables. Again, we're talking about a $50 analyzer. So this is a little nicer set of cables. Uh, you're going to pay a little bit more for a set like this. This is the set we're going to be using with the analyzer. But for our initial testing, I'm just going to go ahead and use what was supplied with the unit. So this stylus came with the PDA. I found that this actually works much better than trying to use the selector switch up here to control the unit. Again, this is just a touch screen. Uh, you can see I can select it with my finger. Unfortunately, moving things like the cursor, you can see there's a cursor right here. Trying to do that with your finger doesn't work very well. Let's just go ahead and we'll run a calibration. Uh, first thing we can do, let's uh, turn off some of these displays. So trace and we'll just do off and trace and off. So now we can select the type of measurement we want to make. We do that by selecting format and we'll select a Smith chart. So we'll try to measure the impedance. You have to also select a start and a stop frequency. It's done off of the main menu. We do that just by selecting back. You can see where it says stimulus. We select that and you can see there's a start, stop frequency, center, span. Also has this CW frequency or continuous wave frequency. Basically it would run it at a fixed frequency. Let's just go ahead and we'll give it a start and we'll select 1 and megahertz and now we'll select stop frequency and let's just go ahead and we'll select 900 and megahertz again uh, there's a little bit of a trick to this so let me just do stop again I want to select to the right of the number so selecting over here you can see I can manually increment those numbers I'm just finding that it's easier just to enter the thing from scratch so again stop 900 mag and that's pretty much it the next thing we do is we have to go through the calibration procedure the way we're going to do that again is we go back to the start menu and we hit cal so it's the fourth one down then we select reset that basically wipes out all of our calibrations and now we're going to select calibrate so you can see the top one is the open, short, load, isolation, through, and done. You can see so I have the through connector attached on one side. The other is attached to channel zero. And we'll start by installing our open. Again, we want to make sure that we actually install the open. That's different from actually leaving the connector open. That little bit of difference in the length would cause an error in our measurement. So we have the open installed. We select open. It highlights and moves down one to the short. So next we install the short. And again we just select the button. And now the load is highlighted. And we can install our 50 ohm load. And just select load. And really again if we're just measuring the impedance that's all we need to do. We can select done. And we could save that to one of the memories. So let's just hit save zero. And back and close. So now you can see the cursor is in the center of the screen. So what I'm going to do now is hit scale and scale per division. Let me go ahead and I'm going to remove our 50 ohm load. So if you don't know anything about a Smith chart, basically the far right of the screen, this is going to be a open. So really what we're looking for is a single point at the far right of the screen here. And you can see that's pretty close. Let's go ahead and we'll install the short. And the short is going to be on the far left side of the screen. And here you can see the dot just shows up on the far left. 
and again if we install our 50 ohm resistor that's going to be right dead center of the screen again at 900 megahertz this will be a pretty forgiving system typically once you start getting up above about 1.5 gig I find that a lot of my homemade stuff starts to have problems but for this low frequency it's not that big of an issue hopefully you can read this but it says uh, channel zero smith this is a 50 ohm resistor and it's measuring in this case a certain amount of capacitance um, it's like 21 picofarads 191 now it's one point something microfarad again this is a pure resistor we can also add traces let's add trace 2 format and then we can do the log mag so again remember how I said this works there's a signal generator in here and it's sweeping currently from 1 megahertz up to 900 megahertz and it's measuring the amount of power that's going out and it's also looking at the amount of power that's being returned this is called the return loss if I have a perfect 50 ohm resistor on this of course all the energy is going to be absorbed by that so as I remove this though notice that the amplitude just rails and that's because 100% of the energy now it's all being reflected back into the unit and it basically rails out the input so this happens to be a resistor from Midwest microwave this terminator is rated for DC up to 18 gigahertz and we can see that is showing log mag 10 dB per division and you can see where the cursor is right now it's measuring roughly minus 36.02 and that's essentially at 1 megahertz so I can grab this cursor with my finger I can try this doesn't always work see if I lift my finger off you can see it's moved the cursor a lot of times what happens is I don't quite get it selected and the menu pops up and that's what I'm saying just using this stylus works much better you can also see where I'm actually dragging it this way so I definitely prefer using this with the unit better yet I'd rather not use uh, the stylus at all you can actually run this unit with the PC it has this USB port so let me plug this thing into the PC and I'll show you what their software looks like so this is the latest version of the software that I found for the Nano this is version 1.03 the way this works you basically just select the COM port and select connect you can do get data you can see it's just displaying a dot off to the right notice the artifacts on the screen this is just a bug in their firmware I'm assuming I've seen that before all I'm going to do is attach a piece of coax cable just so we can get something on the screen and let's select get data again and you can kind of compare the two what that looks like looks like the scaling here is a little off let's try auto scale down here oh nope, that doesn't do anything in the lower left you can see this is where we select the chart type there's polar SWR linear log group delay it's got all the basics let's just go back to Smith chart so originally when I fired up this software I'm like perfect this is really all I need to do a demo with this unit but uh, as soon as I move the cursor this is what I ran into you see how it's flickering this is a fairly old laptop this is an i7 it's running Windows 7 but I tried it on my desktop PC originally and the flashing is so bad with this version of software where it says inductance here you can't even read that it's basically blanked out and more often than not the display readout here itself is just a blank box and you can see I'm not moving the mouse I mean, both my hands are off of it it's just sitting on the table and it just continues to flicker so to me that's kind of a major bug with the software I'm actually surprised that they'd release it like this so I asked around to see if other users had ran into this problem sounds like they have uh, they just consider it a nuisance somebody had pointed me to a older version of the software so this is version 1.01 .01. again we just select connect you'll notice there's no about button uh, so that's one of the main differences that I saw uh, let's do get data again and again we'll select the Smith chart and once again you can see it's flickering you notice right now I don't even have the auto refresh on 
so it's not like the screen is being updated or anything again to me it basically makes the software not usable so let's just do log mag s11 and it looks like now we can do the auto scale and the same thing you can see it flickering so after installing and using it for about five minutes I decided I'm just gonna roll my own software for this so I joined one of the user groups I think it's groups IO or something and I asked around a little bit as far as if anybody had written any software for it and I didn't really get a lot of feedback somebody had posted a list of some of the commands but really you know there's only basically a handful of commands that you need to know to run the thing uh, so that's not all that complex somebody else had posted about how this thing runs at 9600 baud uh, that is not really the case if you're sending like eight data bits a start and a stop bit so 10 bits per byte at 9600 that's 1.04 milliseconds the reason i know that it's a nice even number for 9600 baud then you multiply that by the amount of data that they're sending out of course this stupid thing sends ascii data it's a fair amount of data that they're sending back it's about 2500 bytes so if you take 2500 multiply that by a millisecond you know you're talking two and a half seconds and that's just for sending one array so when you're using this device for transmission basically going between the two ports the software has to send up both arrays so you're actually two and a half seconds multiplied by two plus they send up the frequency which is a whole nother array so it's really about six seconds worth of data at 9600 baud you know so basically i'm saying there's no way in hell it's going to work at 9600 the baud rate really has nothing to do with it. It's not an actual serial port. It's a USB port emulating a serial port. So I tried running a few experiments, and sure enough, I could reprogram the baud rate, and it has no effect as far as the throughput of this thing. It connects and it talks to the unit just fine. So if you plan on writing your own software, that's one of the things that you should be made aware of. So to show you my software, what I'm going to do is move over to the desktop PC. I wrote my software in LabVIEW. So what I did originally is I just basically sniffed this program when it was communicating with the Nano, and then I followed the command format that they were using, you know, essentially in one big serial stream. I don't mean serial like RS-232 serial. I'm talking about the way that I'm talking to the device. So I send a command, and then I wait for a response. Then I send out another command, and I wait for a response. So that did work. I posted a little video of it. The problem that I ran into is basically the user interface wasn't, real responsive there were times that it would hang because while i'm waiting for the communications basically i'm stalling out lab view so i ended up uh, restructuring the entire code so there's actually three processes now there's one for the user interface there's a write process that's sending commands down to the unit and then there's a read process that pulls all the commands out and it parses them and then shoots them back up to the user interface so when you type something on the user interface that'll place the command into the message queue and then the write process will parse through that queue pull out the command and then transmit it up to the unit and then again the read process is just running on its own it sees the message coming back uh, so the format of the data is essentially the command followed by a carriage return line feed, followed by the data, and then it ends with a CH, which I'm assuming is the command prompt, and then that's followed by a space. So the read process is essentially looking for that command prompt to know that it's got a complete message. It then looks at the very first carriage return line feed of the message, and it backs up and it uses that for the command. And then it basically uses that command to decide how to process the message. So that works a lot better. I'm glad that I took the time to restructure it. It really wasn't a big deal. I probably spent, you know, maybe two days, you know, 16 hours or something working on the software for this. All right, so I've got the Nano attached to my desktop. First thing we're going to do is attach a couple of cables. Again, I'm not going to be using the stock cables that come with the unit. I'll be using a slightly better set. Remember what I said about connecting these, that you don't want to rotate the actual cable assembly and you don't want to be touching the threaded part same thing with the torque wrench again hold it perpendicular and just rotate it until it clicks and again we do that for both of them all right so this is the main screen again the software was written in lab view we just select link see it's now communicating with our network analyzer and we can hit scan or sweep in this case 
You can see it's not quite centered up. I do have a load attached, but the instrument has not been calibrated, and that's the reason why it's not centered. So if we just go over the software a little bit, our normal or the normalized impedance of the system, typically you're going to set this for 50 ohms. You can see I can program the center frequency and the span. So in this case, let's say I set the span for 1 megahertz and I set the frequency for 10 megahertz and we hit sweep. And let's just change this over to reflection coefficient. You can see it's scanning between 9.5 megahertz and 10.5. Again, that's because the span is 1 megahertz. If I just increase this to 2 megahertz and I'll hit sweep again, you can see we're now scanning between 9 and 11 megahertz. I can also change the minimum frequency. Again, we'll just go to 1 megahertz and you can set the upper here. This would be 900 megahertz. If I hit scan now, you can see we're scanning between 1 and 900 megahertz. So for these experiments, let's just leave it. So the first thing to do is calibrate it. Again, what you want to do is be careful not to touch the threaded part. And we start with the open. Again, we go to menu and we hit cal and then we select reset and then we select calibrate. And the first one it's looking for is the open. We select that. Normally you would torque these, but I'm not going to worry about that for this bit of testing. Just make sure I'm somewhat tight with my fingers. This is with our short. And again, we'll apply our load. And obviously there's a difference between say this load and the load that's on here. You probably know this, but I've played around with trying to make like my own resistive probes for the scopes and whatnot. Uh, the whole reason that there's two 100 ohms in parallel here versus a single 50 ohm is because what ends up happening is the inductive part of the resistors will dominate. Essentially our 50 ohm resistor no longer becomes 50 ohms. So this combination of two 1206s in parallel actually works pretty good. I've ran experiments using this combination up to about a gig and a half. You get beyond that up into the three gig range, uh, this doesn't work out so well. For what we're doing with this little network analyzer, this setup will be just fine. So the next thing we want to do is isolation. Normally what you're going to do is apply a load on each channel. We just select isolate. And again, we have to apply the through again that's the short and we select through then we select done and I'm gonna go ahead and save this as zero and I'm just gonna select auto so this will automatically update the display now once every 0.7 seconds I think I have it set for let's go ahead now and we'll attach our actual open and you can see again on both the network analyzer as well as our lab view application we now have a dot off on the right and again, if I do the same thing with our short, we'll end up with a dot on the left-hand side of the screen. There you go. And of course with our 50 ohm terminator, we'll end up with a dot dead center on the Smith chart. And there you go. Let's just try again setting this to transmission. Now let's attach our through. All right, and you can see basically our through is flat. So we're reading a gain in dB. Uh, so essentially it's uh, as low as like 0 0.098, 0 0.1 dB. And that's across the entire span of 1 to 900 megahertz. For fun here, you can see I have a small 10 dB attenuator built up onto this little board just made up of three different resistors. This is not what I would consider a precision attenuator. And let's look at our LabVIEW software now. And you can see it's reading 10 dB down. Gets as low as about uh, 10.2 dB. So it's definitely capable of reading this attenuator without any problem. So here we have a 10 dB attenuator from Midwest Microwave. This has a little wider bandwidth. It's rated for DC up to 18 gigahertz. 
to use this we'll install this little adapter all right and again looking at the lab view software you can see it goes as low as about 10.5 db and as high as about 9.69 so i have a second attenuator here again this is also 10 db of course this adds so we are effectively 20 db down let's just see what it shows looks like 20 down to about 20.3 and as high as 19.9 uh, this one's from mini circuits this is a VAT-10 again this is a 10 dB attenuator let's just go ahead and put that in series with the other two and again this should give us a total of 30 dB of attenuation and there you have it so looks like 30.9 or so so fairly usable Again, I think if I took the time to torque this and we actually had some precision attenuators, uh, this thing would actually do quite well. Again, if I terminate the two inputs at 50 ohms, you can see our noise floor is about 50 dB down. So not great, but uh, certainly still usable. So I've made up several other test boards for this VNA. should give you some idea what you can and can't do with it. So this, for example, is a 100 ohm resistor. It's actually two 200 ohms in parallel again, just like our calibration standard. And again, the reason I do that is because the lead inductance of the 1206s will actually dominate. Putting the two in parallel helps reduce that. Let's look at our software now. This is showing a resistance of 99.4 ohms. And if we look at our network analyzer, you can see, hopefully if it shows up on the screen, this is displaying 100 ohms. Let's go ahead and we'll switch this over to standing wave ratio. And you can see it's displaying 2 to 1. And that is absolutely right. It's a 50 ohm system. We've applied a 100 ohm resistor. And so essentially, it's a mismatch of 2 to 1. You know, before I take this off, let's just select menu and let's select SWR and here you go this is what it looks like on the network analyzer and again you can see the readout is reading 2.00 2 to 1 so let's just try it with a different resistor this one is 200 ohms probably can guess what this will do to the standing wave ratio and here you have it so we are now 4.0 to one and let's look at our resistance that we are calculating and you can see this is 198.8 199.1 so again uh, very close to what the actual value is if you look at the return loss again that's this readout here you can see that is 4.5 roughly db and if you plug that into maybe an online calculator, you would find that an SWR of 4 to 1 actually is going to give us a return loss of 4.428. So I've written up here. We can do the same thing with our 100 ohm resistor. Again, this would give us a return loss of 9.58 dB. And you can see our readout is 9.58, 9.60, 9.59. Again, it looks like it's quite accurate. This is a 22 picofarad capacitor. Let's go ahead and attach it. And I'm going to change my lab view software back over to a Smith chart. And you can see we start out with an open. Of course, a capacitor is open at DC. And you can see it just sweeps around this outer edge. And let's look at our capacitance that it's displaying. Looks like 28.7 picofarads. This will be 220 picofarads. And you can see it's reading roughly uh, 219 or so picofarads, 220. Of course, that is going to be dependent on where we're looking. So if you kind of follow the second cursor, so here you can see we're at roughly 64 megahertz, and we're displaying 233 picofarads. Let's go down to 1 megahertz, and you can see it's displaying roughly 220 It'd be nice if this thing could actually output more data points than the 100 or so it can do. Let's try it with an inductor. I've got two different ones here. We're going to start with this one. This is a 2.8 nanofarad. Again, the manufacturer of the data sheet will specify at what frequency 
you'll actually read that inductance and in this case it's at uh, 250 megahertz you can see we're at 234 and it's reading 2.6 nano henry's fairly close to what they claim at uh, 2.8 let's just try it with the other one again this is also measured at 250 megahertz you can see the readout is 27.7 27.6 and this part is indeed a 27 nano henry at 250 megahertz so here I have a small capacitor that is acting as a shunt and another one in series that chats between the two channels. You can see I'm currently displaying the impedance. What I wanted to show you is how fast the software can update. So you can see as I'm adjusting our screwdriver, of course, you know, obviously you're not going to use a screwdriver like this for real. It's just for demonstration purposes. Actually, you can see what happens is I just touch that capacitor with the screwdriver. <laughs> I mean, the effects that that has. That's why you don't use screwdrivers like this to make these adjustments. They sell diddle sticks that you're supposed to use. I'm just lazy and didn't want to go grab one. But you can see as I'm adjusting the capacitor, kind of how fast that screen is updating. So if you wanted to do live adjustments, it would actually be quite useful, I think, for that. Let's just try the other capacitor. Again, this is our shunt. So yeah, it would be nice if it would update faster. Uh, the communications could definitely be improved on this. There's no reason for them to be sending ASCII data up, for example. That could all be something binary. But I'm sure that there's a limitation as far as how fast they sweep it. There's an unusual bit of hardware. This is quite old. This was made by RLC Electronics. See contract number, US, attenuator fixed. See the little stamp marks here where it's been through calibration. This kind of dates it. You can see it's 1 to 10 kilomegacycles. So they don't say gigahertz back then. This was probably from the 1950s, probably for some radar equipment. Let's just connect this thing up. The way we'll do that is attach a couple of adapters. This is almost big enough I can't get the uh, cables through it. So let's have a look here. So again, we're sweeping this between 1 megahertz and 900 megahertz. So you can see we're starting off at a megahertz. It's like 5 dB down. It looks like at about 800 megahertz. It's just about 7 dB down. But again, keep in mind, this attenuator, the low end rating of this is 1 gigahertz. So the network analyzer can't even sweep up to the operating range of this attenuator. You can see it goes through a phase change that happens at roughly 600 megahertz. Again, we can take our cursors and slide that to that data point right where that happens. And you can see it's at roughly 648 megahertz is where it goes through that phase change. So as long as we're looking at old hardware, this is another very old piece of test equipment. This is what's called a grid dip meter. This was made by the Millen Manufacturing Company. This is a model number 90651. What this is is essentially an oscillator. And on the back side, you can see it has different connection points. These coils are all color coded. So you can see yellow, for example, which is what this one is, is rated between 13 and 32 megahertz. The green one, which is this one here, this is rated all the way up to 60 megahertz. And that just plugs into the base. There's two switches. See there's a filament over here. The other one is for the plate supply. Turn on the filament, we'll let it warm up for just a second. And we'll activate our plate. See the meter deflects to the right. Here I have a capacitor and an inductor and they're in parallel. So I'm assuming most of you know this is a tank circuit. It will have a resonant point. Let's just go ahead and bring this close to the coil. And what I'm going to do is sweep our frequency. And let's just see if we can figure out where this thing resonates at. What's going to happen, it's called again a grid dip meter. And the reason for that is because that meter is going to have a dip if we find the frequency where this thing resonates at. Oh, uh, pretty close, right? Looks like right 
about here see how it's dipping and that's the coil look as I move this thing away let me just slide over here watch it's actually coupling from this coil into our little tank circuit and again it's like right there you can just see as I move away from it the needles up high move to the other side it's up high it's like right there so what we can do then is look at our dial and you can see this is just shy of 50 megahertz so that is the resonant frequency for this tank circuit alright so I've just attached our tank circuit to the network analyzer and what I'm going to do is set our center frequency for 50 megahertz and we'll set the span to 30 megahertz and you can see we have this little arc drawn along the outside and you can see as I move my cursor A around this arc when I get close to the zero point we are right at roughly 50 megahertz and of course if we're looking at the resonant frequency of the tank that's going to be 1 over 2 pi times the square root of LC and again for resonance X sub C is equal to X sub L here I have a couple other tank circuits these are built up using surface mount components this one is a 82 micro Henry and a 32 picofarad capacitor the resonant frequency for this should be 98 megahertz and again what I'm going to do is set our center frequency for 98 megahertz and we'll set our span for 10 megahertz and you can see again it's quite symmetrical around the zero point let's just go ahead and increase this a little bit further let's change it to 50 you can see it starts up here at about plus 90 J and down to about minus 90 J and if we look at the center frequency and this is looking at cursor zero you can see it's roughly 88 megahertz so very close to what I had calculated originally Again, this is not a measured value. This is very similar to the first one I tested. This is a 151 nano Henry and a 66 picofarad. This should work out to roughly 50 megahertz. So again, I'm going to set our center frequency to 50 megahertz. We'll change our span to, let's make it 10. And once again, you can see it's very symmetrical. Let's just move our cursor right over that zero point. And again, you can see it's 49. 0.9 megahertz very close to what I had calculated again this isn't something that I actually measured I just pulled some caps out and some inductors I didn't measure them I just installed them and this is what we get so this one is uh, 820 nano henry's and 330 picofarads this should work out to roughly 9.7 it looks like megahertz or 9.2 can't read my own writing I think it's 9.7 Let's give it a try and again we'll just set the center frequency to 10 megahertz and let's give it a span of 10 sure it's fine and let's move our cursor to the zero point again and you can see it's 9.4 megahertz yep 9.4 megahertz so with these smaller parts like this Unfortunately, I don't think that the grid dip meter is going to be sensitive enough to work with some of these smaller components like this. This is the data sheet for a filter. This is made by TDK. This is a part number ACF451832-333. You can see it's a 25 dB attenuation frequency range, 7 to 60 megahertz. Uh, the interesting part down here is looking at the graph. Again, this is the 333 it's the highlighted trace and you get an idea of what this actually looks like so here I've modified one of our circuit boards to mount that filter to it and I have it attached to the through at 1 megahertz it's reduced 10 20 about 30 DB down and that's very similar to what we're seeing with the network analyzer it's starting off at about 14 5 and it looks like it goes down to about uh, 52.3 at uh, 14 megahertz and then it starts moving its way back up I also have this one again it's made by TDK 
This is the ACF 321-825-103. Looks like again about 40 dB of attenuation. It's somewhere around 20 megahertz. So we can go ahead and install this one. It obviously has a little higher cutoff. Let's push the F max out to 50 megahertz. And you can see it about uh, 17 megahertz is where it bottoms out at and then it starts working its way back up. So I've got one other type of filter here that we can have a look at. This is actually a 12 megahertz crystal. You can see that this one's made by CTS. Let's go ahead and install that. If you know anything about a crystal, what will happen is when we hit the resonant point, the impedance of the crystal is going to drop. Let's set our center frequency for 12 megahertz. So let's uh, zoom in a little bit. We'll just give it a 100 kilohertz span. Let's try to zoom in a little bit further. Let's go down to 50 kilohertz. And again, you can see our cursor here right at the peak. We are at 12 megahertz there. This is a 12.01 and 11.99. And you can also see that we go through a phase change right at that 12 megahertz. If you follow my channel, some time ago I made a video where I picked up some fiber optic cable after a viewer had asked me about how to measure the speed of light. During that experiment I showed three different oscilloscopes I have to make that measurement. And those were all pretty high end scopes. But one of the things I had mentioned is that I could actually perform that experiment with my network analyzer. But I was a little concerned that, first of all, the video was quite long already. But I thought it might just be a little bit too complex for people to pick up on. So I thought, well, I've got this little guy out. Let's just try to take that measurement. So this is one of the pieces of coax. And again, this is 147 inches. And it has a velocity factor of 0.78. And again, that velocity factor is essentially the relationship of the speed of light in a vacuum versus how fast we can propagate a pulse down this coax. So if you look at my software, in the upper right section there's a whole nother graph just above the Smith chart and you can see it has electrical length in meters, range in seconds. To the right of that there's velocity factor. Notice again it's 0.78 which is the number for this cable. So let's go ahead and attach our cable. To run this test we only need channel zero. So essentially all we're looking at is the phase change between the input and the output. To the other side of that we'll attach our piece of coax. Again, looking at the software, we're sweeping between 1 and 900 megahertz. And you'll notice this pulse rate here, right in the middle. And if I take our cursor, I start moving that across the screen, and I go to that peak, which is right here. You can see the cursor time, this is in nanoseconds. So our propagation time for this piece of coax is 15.98 nanoseconds. And I'm saying that the cable length, based on that time, and what we've entered in for velocity factor, is 147.13 inches. Which just so happens to be our actual length of coax. So you can see this is another use of the vector network analyzer. And again, this is something that the Nano VNA is certainly capable of performing. So currently I have channel 1 of my Nano attached to the input of our frequency counter. Again, this frequency counter is attached to a GPS receiver that provides the reference clock for my entire lab. So you can see it's currently outputting 2 MHz. Let's just reprogram that so we do CW frequency. Let's just change that to 5 MHz. And there's our 5 right there. Let's just get a little higher resolution. It's pretty impressive. You can see uh, this is 4.999998, so fairly accurate clock on this thing. Let's try going up a little higher. Let's just set it to 10 megahertz. And CW, let's go up to 100 megahertz. Again, it's off by just a smidge. So I was going to set up another demonstration using the Nano. Essentially I was going to take the channel zero and use that to drive the local oscillator of a mixer. I was going to take the IF out of the mixer and feed that into a crystal filter into channel one. You can see where I'm heading with this, but essentially 
uh, sweep this thing across some band and use this as a detector and essentially turn this thing into a spectrum analyzer. Well, it turns out uh, I couldn't actually get it to work very well unless I tighten this thing down, essentially run it at a fixed frequency and then provide a fixed frequency out of the RF generator. You know, you could pick up a signal on the input, but the response time, unfortunately, for the detector on this just wasn't good enough to make that demo work. But I thought it was still kind of an interesting idea. I'm sure I could pull that off with my old antique network analyzer, but that system is pretty much all analog. Well, I think that's going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And to my buddy Flipper, my one and only Patreon, I appreciate you sending me this Nano VNA to play around with. Hope you learned something from the video. Catch you later. Earlier this week, NASA announced the discovery of a possible Earth-like planet located just 31 light years away, a hop, skip, and a jump in cosmic terms that may be able to support life. I think it's an amazing discovery. We have this small mission called TESS that's scanning the whole sky for the brightest and closest objects to find planets like ours, and this is the first one. This amazing discovery was made possible by NASA's Training Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS for short. And TESS actually will continue to go through 2022, so who knows what else? Tess A will super find. Earth only takes 31 years to get there. Yeah, no problem. A super Earth only takes 31 years to get there. Takes 31 years to get there. Takes 31 years to get there. 31 years, 31 years. Located just 31 light years away.